Well, this is our idea of a media storage cabinet. It's constructed in the chest on frame style. Uh, it'll accommodate a wide variety of different uh, VHS tape cases. Uh, there's many different sizes of those, as well as for DVDs and CDs. So you'll be able to store a lot of media in this cabinet. Now, it does have a few features I'd like to point out before we begin construction. Now, of course, we've got two doors that give you full access to your storage baskets. And that'll give you a variety of different uh, places to store the, the various media. Now, once the doors are closed, we also have a secondary level to this where you can store additional media, videotapes or CDs, however you configure it. And we've put it on a balancing mechanism. And then that way, as you're closing one tray, the other's automatically closing with it. And that's to keep the structure in balance, which is a problem with chest on frame type construction. They're always going to be, relatively speaking, top heavy. So by balancing it with this balance mechanism and running everything on these ball bearing slides, things stay fairly well in balance and it operates very smoothly. Now down below, for our bracing, to help keep the frame look very light, we've used some 3 8 inch aluminum rod. And we'll show you how we can bend that so you get those scroll shapes at the ends of them. It's a fairly easy process, so don't get too panicky about working with the metal. Now, to make them look appropriate, all we did was spray them with some black enamel spray paint. First put on a good coat of primer, and then spray painted them. And that's pretty much the introduction to the project. So let's dive right in and we'll get you started with the stock preparation and then we'll move on to the frame. This project has a number of panels that are 7 and 3 16 inches wide. So it made sense to go to the sawmill and pick out 8 inch wide stock. Now that can create a problem because my joiner is only 6 inches wide. So I really can't do any face planing on the jointer. So I took my time and selected very flat, straight stock for this project. Now I've gone through, I'm going to plane each of the boards to their proper thickness and clean up the faces. Then using the jointer, what I want to do is get a nice straight edge on the board that is also square to the faces. Then it's just a matter of going over the table saw and ripping the parts to their proper width. And then at the compound miter saw, we can cut them off to their proper length. But on some components, such as the box components, we'll cut them off a little bit long at this point because we do have to cut that bevel or miter joint later on. And if there's any panels that need gluing up, now's the time to do it. You'll notice that I'm not going to be using any biscuits. This is just your basic panel glue up, so take your time, line up the edges as you draw the clamps tight. Each of the frame rails, both sides and front and back, as well as the center support, need to have a series of quarter inch wide by quarter inch deep grooves machined in them. Now the best place to do that is here at the table saw with a quarter inch stack dado head cutter. I raised it up a quarter of an inch and I've currently got the rip fence set at a half of an inch. Now I'll be adjusting this fence position to account for the position of each of the grooves. Where the rails meet up with the legs, we need to create a mortise that will accept that rail assembly. Now the position of these two mortises for both the front and side faces are different positions from the outer edges, and their depths are different. So take your time, make sure you've got your layout right before doing that operation. Now you could do this with a handheld router with a fence guide assembly. However, the hollow chisel mortiser works out real nice because this is a rather small mortise and it's fairly deep. We're going to need to machine tenons on each of these rails. Now the long and short rails have different length tenons, so pay attention to that. Now to machine these tenons, it's actually going to take four setups here at the table saw. Now I've already established the distance between the fence and this edge of my stacked dado head cutter at 13 sixteenths of an inch, and that's the length for the short rail. I've raised it up 3 sixteenths of an inch, so I'll be taking my face cut along the back edge first. Now I will be using the miter gauge to guide this piece, and you're always told never to use a miter gauge 
with the fence. And the reason for that is, oftentimes people will try to use the fence as a stop when doing cutoff work. And that leaves a small piece between the fence and this edge of the data blade. That's a very dangerous situation. So the way we're going to work this is we're going to start by cutting away this material first, and then for our last cut, we'll bump it up against the fence. That way there's nothing trapped between the dado cutter and the fence. Now we'll have to make this face cut on each end, on the back faces first of all four of our short rails, make an adjustment to the height, take the end cut, make an adjustment to the height, take the other face cut, make an adjustment to the height, and then take our other edge cut. So it will require four setups. Where the two rails meet together inside the mortises of the leg, we need to miter that end cut there, and that's to provide clearance to allow them to come together. The compound miter saw makes this a very easy task. Right on the money. The cut that you just saw me make is a dadoing cut. Now, of course, it's at a 45 degree angle to the two faces, and that's where our bottom shelf is going to sit in there. Now, the setup is rather straightforward, but a bit unusual, so I'd like to take a moment to explain it. Now, because we need to feed this board across our cutter, sitting at a 45 like so, we need to have a rest for it. So I took some scrap stock and bevel ripped a piece at 45 degrees. And I just used double face tape to hold it to my standard miter gauge. That gets the workpiece in the proper orientation. Now the distance from this edge to the bottom of the leg needs to be 10 inches. Now as before I mentioned that we can't use our miter gauge with the fence. Now if this board were up against the fence while we were taking that cut and we got into about this position, we would in this case have material between the fence and the cutter. If we were to get cocked at all like so, it could bind and force the workpiece back at us. So to get around that issue, we install a stop block on our fence. We bump up against that, and then when we take our cut, during the cut, we've got this gap between the end of the part and the fence, and that gives us the clearance for safety. So it's just a matter of raising up the saw blade high enough so that we get our half inch distance off of each face for that dado cut. Along the front and back faces of our legs, as well as the front faces of most of the rails for the frame, we need to machine this 1 8 inch by quarter inch rabbit. To machine that rabbit, I'm using my stacked dado head cutter. I've got it raised up an eighth of an inch and a quarter inch of it exposed from my rabbiting fence, which I've attached to my regular fence. These are the two pieces that will make up the top of the frame. One is thicker than the other. One's 11 16 thick, the other is 3 quarters of an inch thick. So you have to plane that to thickness. And of course, rip and cross cut them to length. Next, we need to machine a rabbit all the way around to create a quarter inch thick tongue. Now because they are different thicknesses, we'll have to adjust our saw blade height or our stacked dado head blade height between the two boards. But the setup is essentially the same as we've been doing for the other rabbits. What I'm setting up for now is to machine the tenon on the end of our frame center support. Now, it's going to be a very small tenon when we're done with it, but it's really only there to help us with alignment during assembly. Now because of the height of it, the distance from the bottom surface up to here is so high I couldn't reach it with my 6 inch stack dado head cutter. So I went back to my standard saw blade, but we'll machine it the same way we machine the tenons on the other components. The rail system that we're using is actually constructed very similar to that of a structural I-beam, the man-made type I-beams that you'll see used for flooring joists. Now we're going to have a field panel that'll be made out of uh, any type of plywood that you want, but it will have to be quarter inch thick plywood. Now I was going to use this piece of crotch walnut uh, plywood, but it turns out I didn't have quite enough. So my next alternative would be to buy another sheet of quarter inch plywood uh, with just straight green in it or something like that. However, I have some babinga plywood, and this babinga is uh, 
adding quite an interesting visual effect to it. It's got this real wavy green pattern in it. Obviously the coloring is a little bit different, but the, the texturing is very, very similar, and I really like the looks of it. You'll notice that where the top panels meet up with the front and back legs, there's a small area that we need to notch out. Now we do have to allow for a little bit of growth in this area, so don't try to get it fit just perfect in there. You do want a little bit of extra clearance. It only takes a minute to go through and very carefully lay out the area that we need to cut away. Now I'll saw real close to the line, but I'll finish it up with a file. Well at this point we've gone through a dry assembly and everything's fitting up real nice. And of course if any of your mortise and tenon joints are too tight, just take a file or a sharp chisel and then shave off a little bit to get them to fit well. Now a couple things I'd like to point out at this time. This top, the front portion of the top, is standing proud of your frame by a sixteenth of an inch. The back portion of the top is standing proud an eighth of an inch. That will give the illusion that our large box is going to be floating on top of the framework. Now we do need to have this back portion higher than the front portion, and that allows the front portion to slide freely without any binding. As shown in the drawing, the bottom shelf is 11 sixteenths of an inch thick, so make sure you plane it to the proper thickness. Then it's just a matter of ripping and cross-cutting to its proper length. Then we need to clip off the corners at a 45 degree angle, and that creates a half inch by half inch chamfer. Compound miter saw makes it real easy, and a stop block makes all four cuts nice and consistent. One of the things I like about Craig's pocket hole system is it comes with this neat little jig that allows you to clamp it on and put a pocket hole screw in just about any conceivable location. Now we're going to be using pocket hole screws to help hold the shelf tight up against the legs. Now remember the shelf is supported by that dado that we've already cut in the legs. One of the last details I want to tend to before assembly, and that of course includes uh, finished sanding and so forth, is that I want to change the color of this babinga. It's a little bit too red for me, and I want it a little bit darker, a little bit richer in color. So what I'm doing is just brushing on a coat of an alcohol-based dye. This, and this will bring the, the color range a little bit closer, a little bit more compatible with our walnut. And now we can go ahead and start assembling our frame. I'll be using yellow woodworking glue for this application. And it's going to start out with the rails and our field panel. Now the field panel just gets centered up over the length of that rail. And then we'll get some glue in our mortise joint and clamp everything together. And then we'll repeat this on the back frame. While the other frame unit clamped together real nice, this one clamped up out of square. And that's a question that comes up. Okay, you check it for square, but what do you do if it's not in square? Now in the case of this particular frame, we really couldn't put a clamp across the two diagonals that we're measuring, because that leg would just bend in as we tried to draw it in. So I've added this diagonal clamp going from this clamp to this one. And now what I'll do is I'll just tighten up the clamp a little bit, and that will draw the frame back into square. And of course we'll check it again in this direction, and we should be okay. Now that the glue's had a chance to set up on our front and back frames, we can go ahead and assemble the rest of the framework. Now our top piece, the back top portion, along with our center support, I've already glued together. The only critical step there is to make sure that your tenons are flush at both ends. To accomplish that, I first clamped it with a long clamp against the two tenons, and then I placed clamps on this way to draw them together. So these two pieces are unified together, but other than that, these top panels will actually float in the grooves. So we'll go ahead and get that in place. Now we can go ahead and work on the two side field panel assemblies with the rails. And now we can bring in the front top panel, and again, as I mentioned, these float in that groove. They are a natural wood product, so we have to allow for them to move around. And that explains why we have those little gaps between the rails and these top panels. Now 
Now I've got some scrap blocks and what I want to do is have the framework resting on the scrap blocks, not our top panels because remember those aren't both at the same level. And this will help make sure that we keep everything in square this way. Now I'll start clamping it up and measuring the diagonals like we always do to check for square. I can get my bottom shelf pulled in between each of the legs and we can tighten up the pocket hole screws making sure that our chamfers are lined up with each other in that dado area. Well, that came out nice. Now, in order to bevel cross cut these pieces, you're going to need a 12 inch compound miter saw to get the throat width or the cut length. Now, in order to get a nice square box with tight fitting miters, there's two conditions that must be met. We must make sure that the opposing sides of the box are exactly the same length. So be sure to use a stop block to control your overall length. And then the next critical element is to make sure that you're actually in fact cutting a 45 degree angle. Now to get that kind of accuracy, what I like to use are drafting triangles. Rather than trust the scales that are on the machines, I bring the saw blade down into contact with that drafting triangle and that gives me a pretty darn accurate bevel. Now if you don't have a 12 inch compound miter saw, you can do these bevel cross cuts over at the table saw. And I'd like to just show you a few techniques there. Now the same rules apply here at the table saw. We have to make sure that our two opposing sides of the box are the same length and that we've got a 45 degree angle. So you're going to need a stop block and use the drafting triangle to set your blade's angle. Now most manufacturers recommend that you do your bevel cutting with the miter gauge with the workpiece away from the blade. So in other words, the blade is tilting away from your hands and you'd cut in this fashion. Now you can, of course, work from this side, but the cutoff piece can be thrown towards you because it's resting on top of the saw blade. And of course, being in this position here and the saw blade tilted at you, it's, chances are good it's going to throw it right at you. Now when cutting on this side, the cutoff piece will be trapped underneath the blade here. Now that can happen quite frequently, actually. Um, the the workpiece is trapped under here, it'll catch a back tooth and get thrown forward. So if you're doing a bevel cut, on the table saw like this, there's one technique that you can do that will minimize that kickback or throwback of the workpiece. And I'll just like to show you that. And that gives you a real nice cut too. Now of course there is one more setting that you have to make sure of. Make sure that your miter gauge is set square to the blade. Now the only thing that's really unique or different about my technique for doing this uh, cut is that I take it in a series of passes wasting away all of the material. And that way I don't end up with a large chunk caught underneath that blade that can be thrown forward. So the technique is up to you. You can either use your compound miter saw if you've got a 12 inch or perhaps a sliding miter saw or here at the table saw. But either way, let's get all these bevel cuts done and make sure our opposing sides are of equal length. Now, as you can already tell, we're going to be joining our box components using a 45 degree miter joint, like so. Now, it does create a very elegant looking joint, but it's very weak. Now, one method of reinforcing that joint is to use a couple of biscuits. And you could use two number 20 biscuits on each joint. However, I'm going to be using what's called a splined miter joint. Now we're going to need to create these small splines and this groove along our bevel cut. The spline would go into that slot and the two pieces would interlock together like so. Now to machine that slot, we're going to need a jig. Now we'll show you how to make this jig, but it's in a separate story in this issue of the magazine. So be sure to watch that story on the jig before you start doing the miter joints. There's one other thing I'd like to point out about cutting these miter slots. Now we could very well get some chip out at the front and back. So using the jig, I'm just going to clamp it onto my board, which is currently clamped to the end of my outfeed table. 
and I've cut some little blocks of wood with that bevel on the front. And I'll slide those in place and clamp them up. And those will help prevent some of the tear out at the start and end of the cut. Now I prefer to make my splines like this out of the same species of wood as the case components. Now I've gone through and resawn this to about 5 sixteenths of an inch thick. and We want to plane it down to a quarter inch thick. So we're going to start here at the planer. Now if you don't have the facility to resaw it, you'll just have to plane the stock down from its full thickness. And then we can trim up one end that's nice and square. And finally, the last step for making our splines is to cut them to length. Now you'll notice that the grain is running in this direction, so technically this is a cross grain cutting operation. But I do want a very controlled width on my cut, so I'm actually going to rip it. Now I'll be just placing the board like so. Got my rip fence set at a half inch for the length, so to speak, of our spline, and it's just a matter of ripping the strips. Along the back edge of each of our box components, we're going to need a half inch wide by quarter inch deep groove. To machine that groove, you could of course do that at a router table. However, I'll be using my stacked 8 head cutter set up for a half inch width, raised up a quarter of an inch, and my rip fence is set at 7 sixteenths of an inch. Now you may wonder why I favor the stacked 8 head cutter over a router bit. Frankly, it's just efficiency. A dado cutter will cut much more efficiently than a router bit. While you certainly could go out and purchase half inch thick walnut plywood for these back panels, it may actually in fact be a waste of money. From the inside of the cabinet, you're not going to see much of that back panel because it'll be covered with, of course, the CDs, DVDs, and videotapes, and then the racks that hold them up. So you're not going to see it from that side. From the back side of the case, some people like to make that look attractive. Um, again, the walnut may be an option for you. In my case, I'm going with birch plywood, and on that back panel of the largest back box, on the outside portion of it, I'll probably just dye it or stain it, similar to what we did with the Babinga panels. Other than that, just make sure that when you rip up your panels, make sure that you get them sized correctly and that they are in fact square, because these are really going to help establish the squareness of your overall cabinet. Now, if you don't have a way of uh, making these cross cuts good and square, such as with a sliding table or a cross cutting jig, try to use the factory edges of the plywood. That'll be a great starting point to make sure you get the panel cut up good and square. Now, before assembling your boxes, you do want to get all your inside surfaces finished sanded because it's very difficult to get at them after assembly. Now, walnut is one of those woods that changes color with age. And unfortunately, it will more often than not, it will get lighter rather than darker. So what I'm going to do is darken up mine right away using aniline dye. Now this particular color that I'm using is a mixture of medium reddish brown and antique cherry brown. And I just mixed the two colors together and did some test samples until I got the coloring about the color that I wanted. Now it will change color after uh, we apply the top coat, so this isn't exactly the color that you're going to see the final project is. But just brush it on or spray it on, however you want to apply it, wipe off the excess, and then move on. And now we can assemble our boxes. I'll be using a slow set glue. And that'll just give me time to maneuver things around. Now, I've already gone through a dry assembly, I know everything's going to fit up, but I do want to have that little extra time so I can tweak things. And then we can get our splines in place. And if they're rather tight fitting, you may have to tap them in with a mallet. Make sure you get the ends lined up. And then bring in the back panel. That can basically just float in there. Then we can get the top in, then the bottom. And the last side may take a little bit of wiggling around to get everything to fit together. And then we'll add a couple of band clamps and start drawing everything together good and tight. 
And we're a little bit out of square. We're a little bit longer this way, so I'll throw a diagonal clamp on there to draw it into square. And I'm just tightening up that clamp until both measurements are the same. Now one of the features that's very unique about this media chest is the ability for the two front boxes to slide apart. And that requires us to use ball bearing slides. Now I picked up some black ones. Uh, you can pick up any color that you want. Black just seemed like the right color for me. Now we do have to provide some clearance back here to allow the slide mechanism to pass through on the inside edges or the inside sides of our two front boxes. And that's what we're doing right now. The narrow portion of the slide is going to mount against the back. So the wide portion will be mounted against our back box and that needs to slide past this area. So what we need to do is notch that out. And now I'm going to use a small handsaw and cut away this material or cut down so that we're flush with this back panel. Now you could do this operation with a router, but a hand tool is just as fine. Using a nice sharp chisel, I can now waste away the center area. On the narrow portion of your slide, there should be one end that has a hook, and that hook goes towards the outside edge of your box. Now we need the other end to line up flush with the inside edge of the box. And I found that in my particular case, a 5 16 inch gap at this end is what allows me to line up at this end. So with that little 5 16 inch gap, I made a little block, and that helps as a jig to line up the holes. I just bumped my slide against that 5 16 shim, mark my holes, drill them, and drive the screws in. And now we can turn our attention to mounting up the larger portion of the slide to the back box. We're going to need to start out with two mounting rail cleats. One needs to be bevel ripped at a 30 degree angle. Now before we mount up our slides, we've got to drill a couple of holes and put in some threaded inserts. Those will be part of the mechanism that opens both trays evenly. Now these are the hardware items that we're going to be working with. This is a threaded insert. We need to drill a pilot hole and screw this into our cleat on that beveled surface. We're going to need a quarter twenty bolt. That's an inch and a quarter long. A couple of quarter inch washers. And then what looks like a pulley. What these are are the bearings and rollers for screen doors, uh, shower doors, uh, you'll also see them on sliding doors. You can pick them up in your home center and they've got this nice little quarter inch hole in the middle that makes it very easy for us to use it as a pulley. So pick these up at your hardware store along with all these other items. The pilot hole for my threaded inserts needs to be 3 eighths of an inch. Now because we're drilling on this beveled face we have to tilt our work so that this bevel is perpendicular to the drill bit. So we tilt the table over at 30 degrees. This board is clamped onto the table to sort of act like a, a fence and a stop to keep the part from sliding down. And that's just clamped to the table. And it did take me about five or ten minutes to get everything lined up. And then finally we've got a long clamp holding our board that we're drilling to this fence board. Now it's just a matter of drilling a hole deep enough, which should be about one inch deep. Now we'll have to tilt the table 30 degrees the other way to drill the hole on the other end of our board. Then we can install our threaded inserts and sand them up. To help with mounting our slide onto our slide mounting cleats, I've clamped a board on there representing the top surface or the bottom surface of the box. Now we know that the outer edges need to be 5 16 of an inch in from the outside edge. So using that same shim block I had before, I'll just make my mark, then I can place my slide on there, line it up with that mark, transfer my hole locations, and mount up the slides. Now we can glue it up and clamp it in place. Now to hold the top down, we're going to be using some carriage bolts. There will be a, a quarter twenty by two inch long carriage bolt, and then underneath we'll put a fender washer and then a quarter twenty nut. 
We'll be drilling the holes using a 9 32nd inch drill bit. Our screen door rollers are held in place with a quarter 20 bolt, a washer, the screen door roller, and then another washer. For now, just finger tighten them in to our threaded inserts. The cable for the balance mechanism that'll run on the pulleys is 1 16th inch twisted steel cable. Now I bought some that has a black vinyl coating on it, and that just looked a little more attractive. Now I'll be joining the two pieces together, or the two ends together, using a ferrule. Now the wire will come in from one side in one direction, in through the hole on the other side from the opposite direction, and then we'll squeeze it together using a pair of vice grips. Cutting this cable off to the proper length requires that you get the cable running around the pulleys and then you pull tension on it as close or as tight as you can get. Meanwhile, at the same time you're trying to hold the cable in its position where it would be running on the pulleys, not pulled way down like so. So you'll get that out as far as you can. Now, the cable is going to come through the ferrule in this direction. What I'm going to do is back off about an eighth of an inch and cut my cable at that point. And then what I'll do is I'll take it off the pulleys and then attach the two pieces together. Now depending on the size of ferrule that you've got, it may not fit up over the vinyl coating if you bought vinyl coated wire rope. So if you did, you may have to strip it back. Now there is a proper tool for doing this, but I've found that a vice grips has worked very well for me in the past and you should have a nice strong joint there. Now I've taken one of the pulleys out and got the other one in tight. Now we can stretch our cable over that and tighten up this one. I guess I could have got it a little tighter, but this isn't bad. Well, that's a little bit stiff. I've got one of the sliding trays in there and what I think is happening is we're probably binding with a wide portion of the slide against this surface right here, probably both at the top and the bottom. So what I'm going to do is take my time and adjust these slides up and down ever so slightly until I get them to slide nice and smooth. And that should do the trick. Now I did have to go through and sand a little bit of extra clearance on this surface near the back side to allow for the large portion of the slide to pass through. Now what we can do is go about attaching our, our trays to that cable mechanism that's going to serve as our balance. I'm going to be using 1 8 inch thick, 3 quarter inch wide extruded aluminum. You can pick this material up at nearly every hardware store and home center. Now what I'll do is just use an ordinary hacksaw and cut off the lengths that I need. Just going to take a file, smooth out that saw cut, and deburr the edges. We're going to use number six by three quarter inch long sheet metal screws to attach our brackets. So we're going to need to drill our pilot holes in our aluminum brackets. We're going to be using a 964 inch drill bit over at the drill press to do that. Be sure to hold your workpiece securely in a vise. Set your spindle speed somewhere between slow and fast. It's only aluminum. I'm getting ready now to bend the bracket. Now I've got it in my bench vise, but you'll see that I've got a couple of hardwood pieces in here as well. And that way as I bend this over, it won't dig into my workbench top. It'll dig into these auxiliary jaws. Now it's just a matter of hammering it over. While the dimension is given on the print, it is probably better to get the dimension directly off your cabinet by placing our bracket against the back of the tray and sliding it up against our cable. Then mark the whole location. We're going to be using 1032 by half inch long machine screws to hold the two pieces of this clamp together. Now I've already drilled the one hole in the small portion. Now what I'm going to do is very carefully position the small portion over the bent piece that's in my vise. I'll bring the bit down and then just center everything up and I'll just clamp everything down and drill through. I'm using a 3 16 inch drill bit to make the clearance holes. Now with both pieces clamped together using our nut and bolt, we can drill our second hole, and that way we're assured that they'll both line up. Now with our cable clamp attached to the cable, we can slide it over behind our tray, line it up near the top so that our screws aren't hitting our support, 
flush with the outside edge, and then we can transfer the location of it by just drawing a line along the bottom of it. Then we can take it over to the workbench and drill the holes for mounting. We'll be using the number six by three quarter inch long sheet metal screws to attach our clamps. So we'll be drilling a pilot hole using a 3 seconds inch drill bit. And you will need a stubby screwdriver to reach back in here. Now with this tray mounted to the cable, I've opened up the tray as far as it'll go. And that'll be when the bracket bottoms out against our pulley. Now what I want to do is measure how far in this tray sticks from this surface. And it's just about two inches. Now before I attach the cable on this end, I'll bring this tray in so that I've got the same measurement and then I can clamp on our cable at this end. That's working real good now. We won't go for final adjustment until final assembly. Now let's turn our attention to the struts that go along the bottom of the framework. And that will help tie everything together and make it a nice rigid frame. To make that nice scroll form on the end of our braces, we need to have a mandrel. And it's very simple to make. Uh, it's going to start out by printing out the pattern out of the, the plans that are on the DVD. Now what you do want to do after printing it out is check to make sure that the outline is actually 4 inches by 4 inches so that you get your scaling right. If it's not, you may have to go to a copy center and either enlarge or reduce it. Next, what we want to do is attach that to a, a block of hardwood. In this case, I'm using hard maple. And then our next step is to drill a 3 8 inch hole in this area. You can use a wide variety of tools to cut out the actual shape. I'm going to be using my bandsaw, but of course you could use a jigsaw or even a scroll saw. All we need to do is a little bit of touch up on the belt sander and we've got our mandrel. Now we can attach it to another board. We're ready to attach it to another board and this will just serve as a base to help us hold everything. And I'm going to attach that with six screws and glue. Now we'll attach another piece of scrap plywood, this is half inch, uh, to the under surface and that will serve as a cleat to help us hold the fixture on our bench vise. Now with the belt sanding operation done, I'm just going to take some fine sandpaper and polish it up a little bit. And I'll work my way through from 220 to 320 and then eventually 400 grit. And now we're ready to start bending the braces. Now here's our jig and everything's assembled as we demonstrated before. Now what we're going to be doing is sticking the strut in to this area. Now as we pull it around like so to bend it, it's going to want to pull out of there. So you're going to want a large screwdriver and that's why that funny shaped notch is in there. You're going to push this down and pry against that rod to hold it into that area. Now as you bend it around, of course you're holding on to the rod. So make sure you've got some very heavy leather gloves to protect your hands. Now to heat up the rod, we're just going to use an ordinary propane torch that you use uh, for sweat soldering, plumbing, and so forth. Uh, most homes have these things. Uh, it takes about, I'm going to guess, about three minutes or so to get it up hot enough. You don't want it to get it cherry red hot. It's not going to get that hot. But you do want it pretty warm. And well, really, after about three minutes of heat, moving up and down the rod in that first 10, 12 inches or so, put it into the jig and try and bend it. If it seems to be resisting too much, apply a little bit more heat and come back to our mandrel and give it another try. Now I did mist this down with a little bit of water before I started the bending process. And that'll help keep this from burning as we do this. There we go, now she's coming nice. I'll just bring it around. And she'll spring back a little bit. But I'll just bring it around so that I'm tight against the shoulder there. Kind of hold it there a little bit while it cools. Then wiggle it back out of the jig. And we've got our first scroll end done. 
Now while it's still a little bit warm, or just simply wait until it's cooler, what you can do is clamp it in your bench vise, and then work it so that it's a little bit flatter. Now you'll notice here I got a little bit of rock, so I'll just put it back in the bench vise, give it a little twist, and check it again. We're getting much closer now, a little bit more. As you can see here, I've got my two cross braces, and these are the back cross braces. Now I bent mine out of six foot material, so they're long right now, and I'll eventually cut them off. But we need to join them at the center with this spider. Now I'll be making mine out of one inch thick walnut, and I took it on the lathe after band sawing it roughly to its round shape. Then on the lathe, I just trued up the OD and turned this little rabbit on the front. Now of course you could just do this all with a bandsaw, a belt sander, and then a router with a rabbiting bit. But in any case, what you'll need to do is put the pattern on the back. And this is our drilling guide to show us where these cross holes are. And this will help us over at the drill press. Now once you get that pattern glued on there, what you'll do is extend the center lines out onto the circumference of our spider and then mark the center line location front to back. Now we can go over to the drill press and drill the 3 8 inch holes. Now here at the drill press I've put the spider in a little vise and I'll bring my drill bit down, lock it down in its down position and then I can rotate it around until that the drill lines up with our guide marks. Once I get it all lined up I can clamp it in place then I'll raise it up and then locate where I need that hole to be drilled. Then I can clamp my vise down to the table and drill the hole halfway through. And I'll have to drill four holes. After some fitting and cutting, I got two of the braces cut to length. Now I've taken the other two braces and laid them on top of our spider, lining up the outer ends. Now I do know that all four of these are coming together at a point inside the spider. So I'm going to cut these two a little bit short and allow the other two to kind of pass through. Now this operation will take a little bit of fitting and cutting. Just be careful, take your time, and don't cut them too short. Well, it certainly took a while to go through and get everything fit up and to get these rods cut off to their proper length. Now there's one step that really got me confused, so I want to warn you about it as well. And it had to do with when I was fitting everything in, I had these scrolls turned the wrong way, so nothing was seeming to line up. But once I figured out that I wasn't following my own plan and got the scrolls pointing in the right direction, things worked out much better. Now you'll notice over here that I also marked my hole locations for where I need to drill to pin our spider to each of these four cross braces. But we'll be doing that operation a little bit later during final assembly. Now what we'll do is we'll turn our attention to how we attach our cross braces to the legs. And we'll show you that on the side legs. Now the first thing you'll notice is that our brace is going to come around from the top back towards the bottom front and curl around like so. Now at the top end it'll fit right up flush underneath our rail and tight against the leg. We're actually going to be attaching these braces to the legs. Just one screw here and one screw down here. Now on this end of the scroll it should just come somewhere around in the middle of the bottom shelf. Don't worry if it's a little high or a little low. Try to make them all pretty consistent. If it's off a little bit, you can bend these things cold just by pulling it on it a little bit so that they're all pretty even. Now what we want to do, now that I've got it clamped in place, is carefully mark the location where our rod is touching against the leg. And then what we'll do is we'll drill a hole in our brace, transfer that location onto the leg, drill the hole in the leg, and attach it with some screws. Now as these are all handmade, there's going to be deviations. So you may want to make a mark noting that this is the bottom of the right side and so forth so that you get all the rods back in their proper location. So I'm just making a mark here so I know where to drill the hole in the rod. Now to prevent the drill from dancing around as we drill into this round stock, you may want to take a center punch or even a scratch all because of the soft aluminum and create a dimple and that will allow the drill to start easily. Now you'll notice when I mark my hole location I tried to draw a line perpendicular away from the leg. And that's to help with aligning the drill bit so that we get this part rotated right so that we drill squarely through our brace. Now what we'll do is just bring it forward, clamp everything down and drill the hole. 
will be attaching the braces to the legs using number eight by one inch screws. So the clearance hole that we need in the brace is 11 64ths. Then it's just a matter of holding the brace in place and using the screw to mark the location on the leg. Then drill a pilot hole for the screw using an eighth inch drill bit, being very careful not to drill through to the other side of the leg, and then drive the screws in to tighten everything up. Now it's time that we start focusing on the doors for the cabinet. Now the doors that I'm going to be using are, in my opinion, very elaborate. Now they can also be very, very simple. Rather than going with a relief carved panel, you could go with quarter inch thick walnut plywood. Or you could even glue up some quarter inch thick walnut and make a flat panel. Or you could do a raised panel. There's a number of different options for that field panel. Now if you've been watching David Riley's segment on relief carving, you'll recognize this pattern. And that's what was the basis for this design. Now I simplified it a little bit and changed it. I dropped down to one of the larger flowers. I also mirror imaged one of them so that I've got a left and a right panel. I didn't want them the same. I wanted some uh, symmetry, but not quite perfect symmetry. Now I went about my relief carving process a little bit different than David did. I got started by taking all the, the patterns from David's, simplified it a little bit, and digitized it into my CAD system. Then from there, I took and created a program for our CNC router. And that allowed me to rough in the entire background and drop down my elevations. It also allowed me to outline much of the leaves and flower components of the relief carving. And that saved me the step of going through and either roughing in the background with gouges or by using a handheld router. And then we just simply put it onto the CNC router, loaded the program into it, and let it run. And it took about an hour and a half or so to go through and do all the roughing for each of the two panels. After the roughing was done, then it was back to the traditional way of doing relief carving. I went through, hand carved each of the elements, dropping down the elements or the different leaves to their proper elevation, and hand tooled the whole area. So that was very traditional, but the approach for roughing in was a little bit innovative and rather unique. Now, of course, uh, again, you could relief carve your panels. You could go with a flat panel, that's solid walnut, or you could use quarter inch walnut plywood. You have many, many options in this regard. However, I must admit that these relief carved panels will really make this piece stand out when it's complete. Now, as far as framing in our field panels, uh, we're not going to be using three quarter inch thick stock, rather one inch thick stock. Uh, these doors are going to function in, in two different ways, so we want a little bit more strength on our door. But it's all going to be joined with mortise and tenon joinery, and we're going to cut grooves to accept the panels. So we'll get started on these machining operations over at the table saw. On the rails, we're going to need to machine our tenons. Now we're going to do it a little differently just to show you another technique for machining them. Now we've got our standard saw blade in here, and it's raised up 5 sixteenths of an inch. The distance from the left edge, my point of view, to our stop is an inch and a quarter. That's the length of our tenon. Now I'll run each face through, creating the shoulder cuts here, make an adjustment to the saw blade height, and then make the shoulder cut on the edge of the board. Now we're ready to start making our cheek cuts, and this will actually set the width of the tenon. Now I like my off cut to come on the outside of the blade, so I adjust my fence accordingly. Now I've raised up my saw blade to the length of my tenon, inch and a quarter in this case, carefully set my rip fence position, and did a cut on a piece of scrap of the same thickness to make sure that I've got a 3 8 inch tenon when I'm done cutting. Now it's just a matter of passing it over the blade, spinning it around for face for face and end for end to make all four cuts. Now what we need to do is remove this material. And to do that, I've installed a quarter inch stack dado head cutter, raised it up a quarter of an inch, and I'll use my miter gauge, and then just take a series of nibbling cuts to remove that waste. Now we're ready to start machining the grooves that will accept our field panel. Now I've gone through and laid out all my work pieces to put their best face forward and mark them. That is the face that will run against the fence. Now I'm still using my quarter inch stack dado head cutter, and I've set my rip fence so that I've got my 
groove positioned where I want it, and I've also installed a feather board, and that'll help keep the stock that we're cutting tight against the fence so we end up with a nice straight groove. Now on the rails, the groove is a quarter inch deep, and then on the styles, the groove is five sixteenths of an inch deep, and that's to allow for expansion of the panel. I've switched to a 3 8 inch chisel in my hollow chisel mortiser, and I'll machine the mortises the same way I did on the frame. Well, after a successful dry assembly, I'm ready to commit my carved panels to some glue and their future home in this frame. Now, to glue everything together, I'll just be using yellow woodworking glue, bring all the components together, and clamp it up to dry. And as this is a natural wood panel, no glue on the panel, just allow it to float in our grooves. Well, that clamps up good. That's one down and one to go. For the hinges, I've selected a sauce hinge. It's a concealed hinge, and it does require a little bit of mortising to do on both the tray as well as the door. It's a very easy operation, especially with the jig that we designed a few issues ago. Now, you may recognize this as the mortising jig that we designed a few issues ago, and it's going to work great for this application. Now, this is the sauce hinge, and as you can see, we need to machine this mortise and it's a half inch wide, so I'll be using a half inch router bit, and it's two and a quarter inches long, or rather two and three eighths inches long. Now the jig is already set up. I've got it clamped onto my tray, or the, the front box. I've set my length of the slot and the position of it. Now it's just a matter of setting my router bit depth at a quarter of an inch, and we'll machine away the mortise for the top portion of the hinge. Now with the mortise set a quarter inch deep, and the full length, now we can work on this area. And it happens to be a half inch in from each end. So I just cut up a couple of half inch blocks that will fit in here to restrict our movement, making that area shorter for the travel of the router. Now I'll reset my router bit depth and finish up the mortise. And as you can see, we end up with a mortise that fits our hinge wonderfully. Now we can drill for our screws and mount up the hinge. And that pretty much does it for the hardware installation. Now there's a couple of things I'd like to point out real quick. Now when you measure the position for your hinges, do it on either the tray or the door, and then holding the end flush, transfer that measurement over to the other component. And that way your hinges will line up, rather than trying to measure off of both of them. If they're different lengths, you would end up with hinges in the wrong place. Now these hinges come with screws. But on the door itself, you'll have to use three-quarter inch uh, wood screws because the, the ones that'll come with the hinges are too long and they'll come through the front of the door. Now on the poles, I just centrally located it left to right, top to bottom, drilled for the screws. Now again, this is a one-inch thick door, so the screws that come with the handle or the pole aren't going to be long enough. So you'll have to pick up some 832 by inch and a quarter long machine screws to make up the difference. Now you certainly could drill the side pieces of our trays and put in conventional shelves. However, we thought that these basket configurations would look nicer for the media. Now our CD uh, size tray will hold about 57 CDs, or in our case, 57 issues of Woodworking at Home magazine. Now we've got a couple different sizes for the video cases because some of them are in the cardboard sleeves, some are in those big uh, plastic bubble cases and so forth. So depending on uh, the sizes that you have the most of, you may want to make the racks to accommodate them. But the construction for these baskets are very, very simple. And you'll just simply get started out by first selecting the material. Now in my case, I selected cherry because I had a lot of quarter inch thick cherry. So that was what I chose for material. Then all the components are just ripped out in little strips. And then really the most complicated part of the process is the assembly. So that's where we'll focus our attention on how to assemble the baskets. Now after we get all the parts machined, we can start assembly of the basket. And it's going to be held together primarily with glue. And we're going to show you two different techniques to create a relatively strong assembly. Now this first technique, I'm going to be using micro pin nails. And I'm putting my two bottom strips on. So I'll just put two pin nails in each, 
after lining them up with the front and back edge nice and flush. And I'll put the other end on the same way. Now the two back strips are also held in place with glue and some pen nails. Now I'm getting a thin film of glue along the bottom edge because that'll sit on top of this bottom piece. Might as well glue those together because we've got a great gluing surface there. Now after getting it tacked in place on the ends with a couple of pin nails, I'll just go along this edge and join the back to the bottom. And then the top back strip gets held in again with glue and pin nails. On the wider baskets for the back box, you'll need this center piece. And that just strengthens up the assembly a little bit more and helps prevent it from sagging. And this gets glued in place and pin nailed. Now I've made layout marks showing me where the center is. I'll just position it in there on those marks and tack it in place. And now finally that front strip. Use your glue sparingly. You don't want to deal with a lot of squeeze out. And I should also mention that it makes a heck of a lot of sense to sand everything up before you glue it all together. Now as you can see my front piece is a little long. I'll trim that up with a flush trim saw after the glue takes hold. As an alternative to using a micro pin nailer, what you can do is glue the whole assembly together but uh, you'll have to use clamps, preferably small ones if possible, tape, or whatever you can use to clamp everything together. Now because most of these are end grain butt joints, there's not a lot of strength, so at that point it's still rather flimsy. Now what we'll do is we'll strengthen up all these joints by using some dowels, and I'll be using 1 8 inch hardwood dowels. Now this one actually was pin nailed together, so these clamps are only there for demonstration purposes. But I've gone through and laid out a mark, 1 8 inch up from the edge. And I'm using 1 8 inch dowel. So 1 8 inch up puts us right in the edge of our board. Now I've gone through, made that layout mark, and then I've made marks 4 inches apart where I'm going to be putting in these small dowels. Now after doing my layout, I'm going to use a scratch all to create a dimple to help our drill start more accurately. Now here in the drill press, I've chucked up a 1 8 inch drill. And as you can see, I've got it up pretty far in the drill chuck. Now of course, you'll get yelled at for chucking on the flutes, but in this case, you do want it to be as short as possible. Now I've got my depth set so that I'm only going in about 5 8 of an inch. Now even though I've got my starter dimple there, I still have to be very careful feeding in so that the drill doesn't walk out the sides of our mating board. Now I'll place a drop of glue in each one of those eighth inch drilled holes. And then I'll just tap in some of these dowels. Now I just cut them off to a couple inches long each. To make it easy. And then after the glue dries, I'll saw them off flush and sand everything up. And when it's all done, it adds a nice decorative touch. Now installation of our baskets won't happen until after finishing. And that wraps up the basket construction. Now we can turn our attention to finishing. And there's an awful lot of little details that need tending to on this. Even though I've gone through and sanded up as much as I could during construction, at this point there's still a lot of detailing to do. So I'll be at that for a couple hours before we start the finishing. To unify the color of the entire piece, I used an aniline dye in my HVLP spray gun and sprayed the entire project down, applying several light coats until what I thought was about the right color. For the top coat, I selected a hybrid waterborne varnish. It's a spraying varnish. I applied three coats of it, thinned down 25% with distilled water to seal the walnut. That, of course, raised the grain because it is a waterborne product. So I lightly sanded with 400 grit sandpaper and some abrasive pads. I followed that with three additional coats of the waterborne varnish and found that it gave me a nice build, but not so much build where it didn't look appropriate for the rough open grained texture of the walnut. 
After the finish has had a chance to dry thoroughly, you can reassemble the whole cabinet. And of course, you'll have to almost follow the same procedure that we did during the filming of the issue. In other words, work from your frame, get your back box on, the slides, take your time and get those realigned so that your two boxes, or all three boxes, line up squarely. I spent nearly three hours going through that lineup process, so be prepared there. Get your balance mechanism in, you'll then install your baskets in the back box, install your front boxes, mount up your doors with the hinges, install your front baskets, magnetic catch, and so forth. And we'll get it all the way up to this point. Now we've got a couple last minute details that we need to tend to. I finally found some hardware that I like for the magnetic catches. I picked these up at the local woodcraft store. To install it, you'll simply need to drill a 5 16 inch hole about 5 eighths of an inch deep into the edge of your tray. Then place the magnetic catch in the hole and tap it in. And the strike plate simply needs to have a pilot hole drilled with a small countersink and then tighten up the screw. And that completes the magnetic catch installation. Now one thing I'd like to point out is the screws that we're using to attach the baskets and some of the other hardware items. More often than not, they're zinc plated or kind of shiny metal. So I just took a bunch of them, screwed them into a strip of scrap material here, and spray painted them black. Works out real easy. Now we can turn our attention to hanging the baskets. On the long baskets in the back box, I use two additional screws along the back strips near the center. And of course those are spray painted black. On all of the baskets, there's just one screw at the top of each end bracket that's a number six by half inch long wood screw. Spray painted black and I just placed all of my baskets in there using a spacer so that they're all evenly spaced. And you will want about three quarters to one inch space between each of the baskets. Anyhow, I just drilled and countersunk a hole and then drove in the screws. On the back of the spider, where our four braces are coming into it, we need to make sure that we join these braces to the spider. Otherwise, if they're loose in there, our cabinet can still rack back and forth. Now, what we're going to use is a number six by three quarter inch sheet metal screw. And if you remember when I did my layout for the uh, drilling of these holes here, I also mark these locations where I want these sheet metal screws to go. Now I can drill in with an 11 64 inch drill bit and drive the screws in. Now you are drilling into the aluminum at this point, so be careful not to overfeed and then when you break through the other side of the aluminum rod that you don't come through the front of the spider. Well that wraps up the construction on this very unique chest on frame media storage cabinet. I'm Chris Dayhut for Woodworking at Home magazine. Thanks for watching.